Welcome to Demystifying Tech, a business cloud podcast which examines the impact of technology on industry and wider society. In each episode, a technologist from one of the UK's most innovative companies will break down a key area of tech and offer practical takeaways for your business. Today, we're joined by Holly Grace Williams, MD of cybersecurity startup Akimbo Core. Holly has an impressive security background incorporating the military and senior positions at major companies. Hello there. How are you doing today? You all right? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to rant about cybersecurity. You're welcome. And, and nice to catch up with you again. We're going to be looking at your specialist subjects, which are penetration testing, chaos engineering, and also helping some businesses figure out how to better protect themselves. So let's have a little look at the, the landscape of cybersecurity. Um, you know, the history of cybersecurity goes way back to Alan Turing. You know, we're talking like, how many years ago is that now? Like 80 plus years. But when did this discipline, as we know it, sort of begin? I think you'll get a lot of people who are quite pedantic with where they want the line to be. And even if you say, you know, modern computing started with Turing, somebody will argue against you and say, well, what about Babbage? But I think for me, with cybersecurity specifically, so drawing a distinction from broader information security and just looking at cybersecurity, I think one of the biggest turning points where you might draw a line and say this is modern cybersecurity would be uh, the advent and the uptake of, of smartphones. Really, where I'm trying to draw that line there by, by making that point of like the release of the iPhone 2007, Android release 2008, like that, those couple of years is where effectively like everybody was carrying a device that had their data on it everybody was nearly constantly exposed to data systems and of course that was the the gentle shift towards um just everybody having some reliance on those systems and then also we can take a look at things like um businesses and uh, at what point did effectively every business become reliant upon computer systems and therefore have worries about confidentiality and integrity of, of data. Um, I think you would struggle these days not to find a company that you couldn't cause significant disruption to through a cyber attack, even if they're not a technical company, a technology focused company, um, just because pretty much every sector now uh, relies on computing to some degree, even if it's as simple as, you know, payroll paying their people, those kinds of things, managing their employee records. So yeah, for me with modern cybersecurity, I would probably draw the line somewhere around the the introduction of the iPhone for that was a big, a big sea change. Well, every business is a tech business, as they say, you know, maybe, maybe not the corner shop, but apart from that, you pretty much everyone's got an online presence or, or by and large. Also, there's that bring your own device side, isn't it? Where people are kind of logging onto their emails, using their personal phones in a lot of cases mm. and, you know, you know, two two FA or you know, two factor authentication uh, is is something that came in, especially during COVID. A lot of companies suddenly went, "Whoa, what is this? We need to get this. We need to protect ourselves." <laughs> but yeah, would you say bring your own device was kind of like a, a like a major kind of loophole for the attackers to, to target? Um, not necessarily. I think uh, a lot of the problem with bring your own device is um, organizations struggling with it or or not wanting to adopt it and just trying to effectively put a ban on people using um, personal devices outright. And that can work in some organizations where you can be uh, very strict in that way. But um, yeah, I think the problem with uh, mobile devices and, and bring your own devices, very often we want to think about mobile devices as something separate. We want to think about them as not the tiny computers that they are. And, you know, for example, uh, organizations might say, oh, we have no bring your own device policy or our staff aren't issued devices. We don't let them use uh, phones to access company data and those kinds of things. But they might still be able to if you have Exchange or a similar email service uh, publicly hosted. Instead of setting it up on a laptop, I could possibly set it up on my phone or my mobile device, like my personal device. Uh, and if you're not doing something to, to um, minimize the risk of that, then yeah, they have mobile devices with um, your company data on them. And it can be as simple as, the, the risk of things like lost and stolen devices. It can be simple as silly things like people leaving their phones on the desk in a cafe when they go to the bathroom and things like that. Um, so there are risks there. I, I don't necessarily think BYOD significantly changed with COVID or anything like that, um, not from a technology point of view or, or a, an adoption point of view, anything like that. I think really, if you were to feel a change there, that's organizations suddenly realizing that there are <laughs> there are these uh the perimeter is not as solid as, as they thought it was people are working remotely and things like that i'm um, just a, a quick distinction on that as well 
Um, very often people use the term working remotely and working from home as interchangeable, uh, and they're not necessarily. So for me, um, working from home would be a known fixed location. Maybe there's some risks there around things like their home Wi-Fi network and, and things, but it's quite a, a well-defined space. Whereas working remotely might be a bit more like what I do, where you know, you're know you traveling a lot and you could be working from anywhere. It could be a, a, a hotel or a, a customer site or anything like that. And some of there are some um, differences with that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I was kind of tempted to uh, to log into the Wi-Fi on the bus yesterday, and I thought, no, don't do that. It's you know, especially when you're talking like company accounts and things like that. So yeah, hot, hot spot into my uh, my work phones are uh, sort of a safer option, I imagine. That's um, that's a great point actually to bring up. This is the kind of thing I mean about um, BYOD didn't necessarily change a lot for companies, but it might have been an awareness point for them where they realised there was risks that they weren't addressing. Um, connecting to public Wi-Fi shouldn't be a huge security risk. Many years ago, it was, especially when uh, many websites were operating without transport layer security and those kinds of things, HTTPS. Um, but every mobile app in the iOS uh, app store uses TLS because it's a requirement of being featured in the app store. Um, huge numbers of websites do. There seems to be this this kind of um, online rhetoric where you know connecting to public Wi-Fi and then connecting to your bank website or something like that is is incredibly insecure. And it's like, well, transport layer security exists and endpoint security exists and it and it doesn't have to be incredibly insecure is, is what I'm trying to say. Social media is one that you mentioned to me in the past as well. So that's you know, everyone's on online now on you know sharing profiles, sharing personal information. What what are the kind of risks there? Oh, uh, this is a brilliant one. So the, there is two sides to this, and it's important to, to be balanced on the subject of social media. But you will see a lot of people, even security professionals, saying things like you shouldn't share personal details on social media, things like your mother's maiden name and your cat's middle name and those kinds of things, because those pieces of information may be used by security questions by vendors. In, and what, that is in, what, in what context would I ever go on Twitter or X, as we now call yeah. it, and start talking about my mother's maiden name? <laughs> Uh, you could be, for example, talking about uh, the history of your family, genealogy. You could be uh, saying, oh, I'm setting up a family tree. Or it could be as simple as, oh, it's my, my mother's uh, anniversary or something like that. You know, people talk you about just wouldn't life think events. about, right? You just, just you know, yeah. here I am. Here's, because, here's, here's my, how my day is going. Kind of yeah, thing. because you think you're talking to like a closed circle of your friends. But of course, this stuff's uh, more public. But the, the big thing about that is people talk about this risk of... Um, sharing that personal information because it may be used for a security validation question. But really, we should be focusing on who are these organizations that are using those insecure pieces, knowledge-based challenges as security verification steps? That's horrendously insecure. And we've known for years it is. There should be better verification steps than you happen to know what my mother's maiden name is, which if you'd like to know, look on her Facebook. Very true. And actually, we kind of think of using the same password across across platforms and devices as being insecure, but we don't think anything of that. You know, I'm not going to say what my mother's maiden name here is, but but it's, it's an easy thing for me to remember. And I think, oh, I can't remember my password for the bank. Therefore, yeah, this is my mum's maiden name. Here's my address or whatever. And but that that information is so readily available, isn't it? Yeah, and I think again, the big onus on the companies there. So um, companies should move away from knowledge based challenges, and companies should move towards enabling users to be more secure. I'm not saying necessarily every company out there should enforce multi factor authentication, but it should be an available option. All of the social networks have that. Uh, you know, it's not enabled by default, but it is an option if you would like to enable it. If your threat model includes risks via social media, uh, and in the same sense that. Um, these organizations should enable enable you to use uh, technologies such as password managers, making it easier for you as a user to address the risk of password reuse. If your uh, website, and some major websites do, have things like very short maximum password lengths or have things like you're not allowed to paste into a password field, for some reason, websites prevent that. They're making it harder to use uh, password management software. They're making it harder to make good choices around using passphrases rather than passwords and that kind of thing. And again, I'd put a huge amount of that on the vendors themselves, the companies who are making these websites. Instead of just telling users you shouldn't reuse passwords, make the process for them having secure passwords and making good password choices easier. We um, spoke to a company recently called Zali, which is mm -hmm. based in, in, in Manchester. And it's trying to get rid of passwords and we said to him so how you know is it is it three fa is it four fa he said more like, more like 100 fa <laughs> you know he's you know we really do need to kind of um find these new technologies which can can go beyond the expectations of today right 
Yeah, and it doesn't have to be very complex. There's there's other ways of implementing it. For example, there's a couple of organizations that I work with where you log into their end user devices. So as a staff member, you log into your laptop with your ID card. So instead of having a password, there's a digital certificate on your ID card. It's a different risk. I'm not saying that's that's an unhackable solution, but nobody on their network has password one on their pass as their password because they've moved away from passwords uh, in that way without it being some huge zero trust implementation or something like that. They've just made a different choice. And uh, in that regard, it, it's more secure in, in context. Ransomware was something that sort of hit the headlines a few years ago. Uh, NHS got attacked, major organisations, and but it's actually older than you, <laughs> yeah. which, is a, which is a fun fact. <laughs> this is a fact I love to drop in every uh, public talk that I give where where I'm talking about ransomware. People, people constantly talk about ransomware as if it's a a new threat, and it and it really, really isn't. Again, people will be pedantic with with where they draw the line on what was the first ransomware and things like that. But something like the AIDS Trojan, which is released on physical floppy disk in 1989 is a good candidate for for the the first ransomware based on its behavior locked you out of a device and demanded a monetary ransom to be paid by a banker's draft to a PO box of course because it predates cryptocurrency as we know it um so yeah ransomware uh definitely isn't a new thing um and and also i think because ugh, cybersecurity professionals have been talking about ransomware for a long time um, people get a little bit worn down by it. They get a little bit kind of um, frustrated where everybody's focusing on ransomware. But the fact of the matter is it's still a threat that faces a, a huge number of organizations. You know, we, we see several companies this this week have been hit um, by ransomware. So yeah, it's not a not a thing that is going away uh, to any degree. I think a, a good example for for this week, if you wanted to, to put a line in the sand and say, hey, look, another company hit by ransomware, um, Johnson Controls International. Employ 100,000 people, they've been hit by ransomware. Um, and I'm sure you could, a quick internet search would show you five more this week. So yeah, it's been around for a very long time and it's still a problem that we're, we're struggling with. Some people might ask, like, why haven't we solved this problem yet? Um, there's two sides to that. It is a difficult problem to solve. No doubt I'll get into some of the details as to why it's not as simple as just to restore from backup when it comes to ransomware. Um, but secondarily, um, the the threat actors, the the cyber criminals, the the bad people, however you would like to name them, uh, are hugely incentivized to perform ransomware because, in many ways, it is the path of least resistance to monetizing that attack. If you have a threat group whose goal is financial gain, a lot of companies out there that you hit them hard enough with ransomware, they'll pay the ransom. It's an easy way to monetize your attack. You know, threat actors aren't looking for the coolest breach or the the um, most interesting uh, piece of malicious software. They're looking, in many cases, just to for financial motivation, just to monetize those attacks as quickly as possible. Yeah, there's other threat groups who have other things like uh, theft of confidential information, intellectual property, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of them out there that just want to make money as quickly as they can and ransomware works. Before we sort of profile Akimbo Co and, you, and your good self, mm -hmm. is would it work just to kind of make paying a ransom illegal? Because if, if you kind of nip it in the bud there and just say you are not actually allowed from a legal perspective to pay it, would that not make the problem go away? Uh, it, it depends on your definition of the problem. Uh, if you made paying ransoms illegal, would it make ransomware go away? Uh, yes, if you prevent threat actors from monetizing through ransomware, uh, ransomware wouldn't happen anymore because they would do something else. They would, they would monetize in some other way. Um, it, you know, you're not solving the problem if threat groups exist there. Um, but it is an interesting uh, thing. And I think some people may be frustratingly say, well, why don't we just outlaw paying a ransom? But of course, the flip side to that is those companies who have just been ransomed and will be ransomed in the near future, if you make it illegal for them to pay the ransom, they've got to go through all of the pain of restoring their systems through some of the mechanism. And some of those businesses will go uh, out of business, frankly, but because of that. Um, so yes, it's a pot potential technique uh, to just just ban the paying of ransoms, but you're, you're putting the weight on the victims there, not on not on the threat actors. Truth is, it, it's a hugely complex problem, and that's why it's been a problem for three decades. Yeah. Let's look at your good self then. So you were in the military for many years, mm. uh, and obviously you've got a, a business career as well. Just just give us a little bit of a kind of background on, on your career. I don't know if I was in the military for many years. I, I served for about five and a half years. So for some people, you know, who are doing 22 years, 24 years, that that's uh, Very true. Barely, <laughs> barely breaking a sweat with service, but it, but it did serve. So I did um, secure communication systems, with installation, maintenance, and decommissioning of secure communication systems. So I think people can see it, the, why I would move from that to something like penetration testing and, and the work that I do now. Mm. Um, people often ask, like, oh, like, 
you know, have you always wanted to be a hacker kind of thing? Have you always wanted to do this? And, and for me, no. I was interested in uh, computer networks and communication systems and how those things work. And as a side effect of, of serving in the military where security is just a huge focus for them, it's a, it's something they um, invest in and worry about massively. That kind of pushed me towards cybersecurity. Uh, and then I got my degree after serving. I have a master's degree in information security. So uh, yeah, a bit of an interesting career. Um, I think it's a very good way of doing it, um, serving in the military, getting some industrial experience, grabbing a master's degree, and then now working in uh, for a Kimbo doing doing pen testing. But yeah, it's a bit of an unusual one. It's certainly not the the college, university, academic, traditional route. Well, actually, there's, there are quite a few entrepreneurs, which you are now as well, uh, who, who come out of the military and mm -hmm. maybe they struggle, not saying you did, but they kind of struggle to adapt to Civil Street and actually being their own boss and being able to introduce rules and and hold people to account actually helped them to kind of adjust. And so I think there is quite a lot of ex forces people mm. actually in the business community. A couple of things on that. The first is um, I didn't leave the military and then become a civvy in the traditional sense of like working for a company and things like that. Um, yeah. I left the military and then went full-time university to do a master's degree. So that shift from regimental service and military to being a full-time student well, that was a hell of a cliff to fall off you know in terms of just like um yeah nobody's watching what you're up to or even counting your attendance it's just you know there are some lectures if you would like to to go there um so it's so a very very interesting a another important detail on on the military side of things i think people have a very stereotypical view of what the military is and when they look at um maybe what they would assume uh, a veteran leaving the forces would look like. Um, the military is a slice of society and there are all kinds of people in the military. So um, yeah, there's going to be a huge number who, who like me, come out, start a business uh, and work for themselves. Uh, and equally, there's going to be a huge number of people who, who take every other route that you possibly could. Um, the military is just a huge company. There's many, many people who work there from many diverse backgrounds. So yeah, sometimes people, I think when I say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm ex-forces or I, I um, served operationally and things like that, people still have that view of like wearing red coats and standing in a long line. And it, it's very much not that. So tell me about Akimbo Corps and, and, and also explain what is penetration testing? Mm. We talked about pen testing, penetration testing, but what mm. actually is it? So Akimbo Corps is a cybersecurity company that focuses on penetration testing. I founded a Kimbo Core to address what I think are some of the weaknesses of pen testing. Uh, for those who already know those terms, I'm talking about things like the commoditization of pen testing, companies being inflexible with how they deliver engagements and things. But the question of what is penetration testing? Uh, for me, it is a scope-restricted, time-limited, manual security assessment of a system. So what we're talking about here for people who've never come across this term before, maybe you work in IT and pen testing is just a thing you occasionally hear about, but you've never really looked into it. It's ethical hacking, right? It's trying to break into a, a, a system to demonstrate risks within that system. The ultimate goal is to address those risks so that an organization is more secure. But from the tester's point of view, from my delivery point of view, it's trying to hack in to demonstrate that it's possible and to show the real world risk of that. So sometimes we have things like, oh, you're missing a security update. But what does that tangibly mean for that company? Where with penetration testing, we can come in, we can show what weakness that security update addressed. And by leveraging it or exploiting it, if you prefer that term, we can show what is the worst case that an attacker could do for your organization. What that end step is, it's going to differ greatly for every different organization. As we've mentioned, there's a huge number of organizations out there who are worried about ransomware and things like that. So maybe we could demonstrate that that is a leverage point into a ransomware attack. There's a whole other ways, uh, many, many other ways that we could uh, impact organizations as well, from brand damage, intellectual property theft, and those kinds of things. And we would tailor that to the thing that the organization is worried about. So we would show them a real world view of their uh, current uh, risk landscape, effectively, the currently, uh, how, how bad is it? The two details that are important from that. Um, we're not just academically looking at missing patches and things like that, we're exploiting vulnerabilities. And secondarily, when I say currently, it is a point in time assessment. I could come in today, do a security assessment of your organization, and then um, tomorrow things might change. So it is important to think of security testing and pen testing specifically as something that is performed ongoing. It's no good having a pen test once and then saying, right, we've we've done that now because because things change. Um, in in the very least, you know, companies grow, companies scale. You bring in new systems, you change your network, those kinds of things, and those will impact um, how uh, representative that security assessment is of your network. But yeah. Short answer, I hack things for a living. But it's also the, the human aspect, you know, social engineering, all that kind of stuff. But I mean, presumably, if the threat, you know, faces every business, 
a huge proportion of businesses actually use pen testing, or do they? Uh, no, they don't. Sometimes the statistics are surprising to me. Of course, I have a biased data point of uh, being a pen tester. Every company that I work for has pen testing done, but but it isn't actually the case. There's still a lot of organizations out there that, that aren't doing pen testing. There's still a lot of organizations out there that aren't doing what I would consider very fundamental security tests, running vulnerability scans, running some kind of software to verify that your processes are working. So just because you have a system that is going out and pushing updates to all of your servers, is it still working or has it crashed or has its license expired and it's no longer doing that that job kind of thing? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of security testing and not every organization performs every kind of one, but specifically for pen testing, it might surprise some people how, how few companies actually get pen tested. Um, Office of National Statistics released some data a couple of years ago that said for large organizations, it's something like 50% of them uh, have penetration testing performed. And for if you include all organizations, the so smaller medium as well, uh, it falls to about 13%. So there's still a huge number of organizations out there that, that aren't performing pen testing. I think a part of the reason for that is some organizations maybe think uh, it's not an appropriate service for them or it's something that you have to grow to a certain maturity uh, for it to be beneficial to you. There is some degree of that. Of course, you need a, a certain de- reliance on technology, but I think these guys, that's pretty much every company. Um, and the fact is, uh, security tests and pen tests can can be small, can be simple assessments. If you've only got a simple network, if you've only got simple systems and a small number of employees, it doesn't have to be a huge engagement. So yeah, surprisingly few organizations, from my perspective, have pen testing. Another aspect is the very excitingly named chaos engineering. Mm. And some very big name brands adopt this. Can you explain how that differs from pen testing? Yeah, chaos engineering is a great thing to talk about, um, especially when we look past penetration testing. So with penetration testing, we're looking at um, finding vulnerabilities in systems and leveraging them to demonstrate risk. Where with um, chaos engineering, we're looking at something a little bit different and we start getting in towards um, instant response and an abilities, uh, organization's ability to respond to, to certain threats. So penetration testing is a service that Akimbo delivers, but chaos engineering is a great thing we like to point out, although we don't deliver it as a service of um, demonstrating something. So for example, when I talk to an organization and I say something like, okay, if this asset, if this server got hit by ransomware, how quickly would you be able to recover that data? And very often you'll get a oddly round answer. So they might say something like, oh, uh, eight hours for us to recover that asset. And usually where that's coming from is some kind of SLA or some kind of business continuity document that says that the organization has agreed it will take them eight hours to restore that asset. And for me, that's always a concern. Uh where they don't know exactly how long it does actually take them to restore that service. Because usually what it means is like, we have a plan somewhere on a network shower and a filing cabinet that says we can do it in about eight hours, but they're not practicing. So from a cybersecurity point of view, when it comes to, to practicing, that can be um, literally doing instant response tabletop scenarios. So so walking through, if we got hand- hit by ransomware, how would we handle that as a paper-based exercise? And then you can build that up to something like a full-on red team or bringing in a threat hunting exercise and those kinds of things. But chaos engineering specifically, what this is, is looking at your systems, not from a security point of view, but from a resilience point of view. So um, if this server failed for some reason, and that could be something like a software corruption, or it could be a hardware failure, it's disk fails. How would that impact our systems and how would our systems be able to recover from that? An awful lot of organizations these days are are running on cloud services and things like that. And they have uh, features such as um, auto scaling and the ability for their systems to automatically react to that kind of thing. So that if a server fails, a new one will be spun up. And it's effectively moving away from this idea that you do once a year, uh, you know, a business continuity test where you say, okay, things have gone wrong. We'll try and uh, restore from backup. And you go to a more frequent uh, broader range of tests where you're testing your resiliency. So uh, we do a lot of case engineering here for testing our systems, and we're doing something about every two weeks from a simple, that server's hard disks failed, that one's hard disks fold, uh, right up to um, full server level failures, full feature level failures. And what that brings us is uh, muscle memory. So it's not once a year that we're trying to deal with what would we do in this in this instance where we're, we're playing through that very, very frequently. And the reason I like talking about chaos engineering is I think more organizations should be thinking that way in regards to cybersecurity. Don't be running like incident response scenario testing once a year. Don't be running these engagements where you test your ability to respond once a year. Be doing them more frequently so that when somebody says, how long would it take you to respond to this kind of threat or this kind of incident? You don't say, well, our SLA says eight hours, you say. Two weeks ago, when we last tried that, it took us this long. 
to restore that web server takes us seven minutes because we do it. We do it regularly. We have that muscle memory. Um, beneficial for two reasons. Muscle memory, you'll you'll be able to respond more effectively because you you uh, more practiced. Um, but but secondarily, it allows you to test your systems against uh, realistic incidents. You know, stuff's going to fail. You're going to get hit by attacks. And and being able to test your systems against uh, realistic incidents, you'll you'll much more uh, you'll have a much more effective incident response capability not just a dusty plan on a network share somewhere that nobody reads. And the kind of companies that are using that are, I think you said Netflix and, and LinkedIn. Mm. So companies that are, yeah, yeah. absolutely you know, billions of users, presumably, or, or certainly hundreds of millions. And yeah. Th- yeah. therefore it's it's not just the case of getting someone into the building <laughs> once a month to to test the systems. It's, it's just a constant kind of continuous assessment, isn't it? Yeah. And, and of course, uh, organizations at scale like Netflix and LinkedIn, those are two real good ones to look at if somebody's new to case engineering and wants to read more and wants to kind of bring in some of those capabilities. Um, one of the things that they're looking at is uh, just damage limitation, reducing blast radius, those kinds of things. So what I'm talking about here is um, if this server fails, how do they still deliver the service to their customers almost transparently so the customer is unaware of that failure? And by practicing more kinds of failures, more regularly, they build more resilience. So resilience isn't necessarily a term we think of when we have our cybersecurity hats on because we're focused on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But resilience is a part of availability. It is something we should think about. And also, like I said, that mentality of delivering house engineering, I think we can bring more of that into pen testing in terms of things like instant response testing. Let's distill that into some practical tips for for businesses of any size, tech takeaways. Um, can you just give us a few quick fire tips for businesses to to sort of remember? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is is just test your systems. That that's it. That could be like as we talked, penetration testing in terms of like actually verify that that those um the security protections you're putting in place are working, but also chaos engineering or very, very simple things. I mentioned earlier, if you have an automated process for things like delivering security updates go and check that it is working, that that server hasn't crashed, that its license hasn't expired, those kinds of things. And do that, not at this, for some reason within cybersecurity, we have this idea that these tests should be run annually. No, no, you should be doing these very, very, very frequently, ensuring that those um, fundamental security aspects are working. That could be something that you do in-house where you specifically go and you say, okay, we have this process. Is it working correctly? Or it could be something that you're bringing third parties in for, uh, such as penetration testing and chaos engineering specialists. Um, But a lot of it you can do yourself. The big thing, though, is um, test your systems. Are they actually working? And what you're looking for there is is not just that functionality of ticking a box of we did a business response test or we did a pen test, we've ticked the box, but building that muscle memory for for how are you responding to these so that you're more efficient when something unintentional goes wrong, when a system fails and you didn't plan for it or when you get attacked and it's at a really inconvenient time like 2 a.m. on a Sunday. (laughs) And yeah. Do not ignore software updates. Do not snooze them repeatedly. Make sure that you're always always aware of, of making sure that when, when you get a software provider to keep those systems up to date. Yeah, I mean, uh, so- software updates are a huge part of it, not only like snoozing those updates and things, but um, I, I don't think organizations, generally speaking, where possible, should be relying on things like manual software updates. Uh, leverage automation where you can and then verify that automation is working. Um, yeah, so yeah, you should install your software updates, but that that shouldn't be the intern trying to run physically around to each server and clicking Windows update, Windows update. You should you should have uh, more rigorous processes and be leveraging some automation where possible. Okay, let's round things off with a bit of personal chat. Tell me something about yourself that would surprise me. I, th- I think some people uh, know this, but a lot of people don't. Uh, one of the things I do outside the office, I work for Matt and Rescue. So if I've been slowing my words and sounding very tired today, don't worry. That's because I am. Because we were on a, a mountain rescue call out last night, so that that's something that I do. Oh, were you indeed? going helping? Did it, uh, um, maybe this isn't the, the right <laughs> question to ask, but did it go well? <laughs> yeah, it did. It the did. Rescue to um, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with mountain rescue, there's there's different areas to it. There's there's missing person searches, and then of course the stuff that people expect, people getting injured in the out of doors. Uh, so sometimes it's simple stuff. In fact, quite often it's simple stuff. You know, a lower leg injury, somebody's tripped or something like that. The, one of the problems is, as as people, we're, we're quite vulnerable, aren't we? We're quite squishy. You don't have to fall very hard to hurt yourself quite badly. And, and if you're out there, uh, you don't have to be very far out for an ambulance not to be able to get to you. And in those instances, it's quite likely that it would be a mountain rescue team that that comes to help you, even if it's just to carry you to the roadhead to a, to a land ambulance, or if it's to call in additional resources like an air ambulance. So yeah, it's a a, a huge part of what I do outside of the office is uh, upskilling for that for that mountain rescue thing and and doing that as a voluntary thing. 
Good on you. And actually, normally I would close things off just with that little tip. Well, that's really, really interesting. Did How did you get into that? Mm. So uh, it's an interesting one because like, it's like, oh, how how did I first think about that I wanted to do that? And how did I first think about that? That would be um, something that would suit me as a character that I might be a, a good person. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I can tell you, for example, when I was in the military, I, I did serve on uh, a kind of rapid reaction force, uh, doing things more like uh, humanitarian work and dealing with um, instability and those kinds of things. So there's some parallels there with my with my prior experience. And of course, in the military, there's a, a, a big part of like uh, those medic capabilities, the primary server capabilities and dealing with uh, the kinds of injuries that you might see in the outdoors, uh, as well as some more uh, significant trauma. So I think, you know, just some of my background generally led me to this. But the big thing is, uh, for me, just spending a lot of time outdoors, doing a lot of hiking, um, climbing a lot of mountains in the UK and, and wherever I can get to. And like I say, you don't have to be far out for um, small problems to become big problems, getting caught out by the weather. As we're approaching winter now, people getting caught out by uh, the short nights. You know, going out without a torch or the torch not being charged and suddenly you, you're, you're out, you know, you might only be a couple of miles from home, but if you haven't got light, then it can be very hard to get back. So uh, helping the, the public in those ways. Don't go hiking in your flip flops. That's a good a good tip. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things one of the, that, that is a thing that happens. People go hiking and dressed inappropriate and those kinds of things. But I don't want to put too much weight on that uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is we don't want to discourage people getting out there. Uh, you know, it is good to go to the outdoors. It's it's great for you. We should have that as a resource. But but secondarily, we shouldn't think too much about the people who get caught out in the outdoors are just those people who are unprepared. Things can go wrong. You know, uh, we have cases, simple cases of people like going out to walk their dog and tripping over the dog and getting quite badly injured or things like um, mountain bikers coming off mountain bikes. You know, just just the speed element can cause some, some serious injuries. So, yeah, um, don't go out into the outdoors thinking, well, I'm prepared, so this won't happen to me. It can happen to anyone just through bad luck. Um, so yeah, some of, some of it is people going out in flip flops and trying to climb mountains, and some of it's just you know people getting caught out with bad weather, with short nights, with a, 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 a simple fall leading to a, an injury. It really can. And a friend of mine, Jamie Hardesty, who works at Sunderland Software City, actually fell off a mountain uh, and broke his back, and he's on the road to recovery. Very outdoorsy kind of guy, very experienced. Um, and he's had to teach himself to walk again. It's gen genuinely, if you follow Jamie on Twitter, you'll see kind of the updates on his progress. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, anyway, lovely to speak to you today. Absolutely amazing. Great tips for businesses. You know, if, if anyone needs protection, go to a Kimbo court. If anyone needs rescuing, go to Holly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the, the key thing. If you've got any feedback on today's episode, leave us a comment on YouTube, LinkedIn, or X. You can also drop us an email at podcasts at businesscloud.co.uk. If you like what you heard, go right ahead and like and subscribe on whichever platform you're using today. We'll see you soon with another episode featuring a renowned UK technologist. Demystifying Tech is a Business Cloud podcast produced in partnership with pan-European B2B tech PR and communications agency Taito. New episodes are streamed on Business Cloud's YouTube, LinkedIn and Twitter pages from 12pm on the second Friday of every month, while you can find all episodes on YouTube and all major audio podcast platforms. Subscribe now so you never miss an episode.